All right, so welcome back. This is going to be our very first screencast for third quarter. And in third quarter, we are going to focus on three different areas. We are going to begin the quarter with the area of genetics, and that's going to be found in Chapter 11. And we're also going to look a little bit more at DNA, and that's going to be Chapter 12. Then we're going to finish up the quarter with um, Chapter 13, and that chapter is going to focus on something called protein synthesis. And so we're going to start off with section 11.1 .1, and this particular section is going to look at the work of Gregor Mendel. And Gregor Mendel is considered the father of genetics. So before we get started with our discussion of Gregor Mendel, what we want to do is we want to make sure we have a very clear understanding of what heredity is. Now a lot of us have heard the word inheritance and a lot of times we connect the word inheritance to some type of monetary gain which means you're going to get money from someone but in this case we're talking about a set of characteristics that have actually been passed from the parent to the offsprings. Now if you decide to go and study heredity, maybe if you decide to go to school, if you decide to go to college and study heredity, then you will actually be um, focusing on an area of science that is called genetics. And so genetics is considered the scientific study of heredity or inheritance. Now as we had said, this section is going to focus on one man in particular and his name is Gregor Mendel. Now Gregor Mendel is considered, as I had said before, the father of genetics. Now this man was an Austrian monk and he was born in 1822 and he studied science and mathematics at the University of Vienna. Now he was an Austrian monk and so he was definitely involved with the church and he actually worked in a monastery but he was also a high school teacher. Now while he worked at the monastery he also tended what we call the monastery garden and in this garden, you can kind of see the garden over here off to the right hand side, what he did is he spent his time raising garden peas and those garden peas are really significant because that information that he gained from his studies with those garden peas helped to establish a lot of the principles that we actually know about genetics at this time. As we had said, Gregor Mendel was very involved with his garden at the monastery. Now, he was making careful studies as to the passing of genetic traits from generation to generation with his garden peas. But before he could actually do that, he had to become very familiar with the anatomy of the flowers that were produced by this plant. Now, garden peas reproduce sexually. Now, what that means is that they actually have both male and female reproductive parts in the same plant. Now, if you look over here on the right, this picture is actually a little bit misleading because it shows actually two flowers and each one only has one of the reproductive parts. If you notice on the left, this flower is representing supposedly a male flower that actually produces pollen, but again, that's kind of misleading because these plants or these flowers actually have both reproductive parts. So actually the female reproductive part is missing in this flower. This male reproductive part though is called an anther. And this anther is going to be the part that actually produces the male reproductive cells. It's kind of similar to the sperm that's produced by animals. Now over here on the right, this is a pistil, and that's going to be P-I-S-T-I-L. And this is going to be the part of the flower that actually produces the eggs in the plant. So this is going to be considered the female reproductive part. Now, as I had said before, typically these flowers actually have both. So why are they representing the picture in this way? So what Mendel needed to do is he needed to actually control when and where fertilization would actually occur in the garden peas. Now remember, fertilization is simply the joining of the reproductive cells. So that would be the joining of the male reproductive cell, the pollen in this case, and the egg in this case. And so again, he had to control this. And so what he did was he simply um, snipped off the anthers of some of his flowers. And if you look over here on the right, you'll notice this one is missing the anthers. And what that does is it actually prevents that flower from self-pollinating. All right. And now most of Mendel's plants were considered what we call true breeding. And what that means is that basically if you left the flower as it is, in other words, if it had both male and female reproductive parts, it had the ability to pollinate itself and typically all the offspring that would be produced from that self-pollination would be identical to the parent because there would be no change in the um, traits of that plant. So basically we're talking about all the characteristics, which again we use the term traits, it's kind of the same thing, 
would be exactly the same in those offspring. Now Mendel studied seven different contrasting traits. Now contrasting means very different traits. Now if you look over here on the right hand side you can see the different traits that he looked at. He looked at the color of the flowers. Some of them were purple, some of them were white. He looked at the position of the flower. Some of them were um, placed axially on the plant which means off to the side. Some of them were considered terminal which means at the tip. He looked at seed color. Some were yellow, some were green. He looked at the shape of the seeds, some were round, some were wrinkled, the shape of the pods, some were smooth or inflated, some were constricted, he looked at the pod colors, some were green versus yellow, and he looked at stem length. Some of his plants grew very tall, while others were considered dwarfs or very small. Now, if he took um, two plants that had contrasting traits, in other words, very different um, looking characteristics, and he crossed those plants with each other, again, through cross-pollination like you see up here, then these offspring that were produced from that cross were considered hybrids. Hybrids are any type of offspring that actually has characteristics from both parents. I'm a hybrid and you would be considered a hybrid as well because you have characteristics from both of your parents. So again, when you talk about genetic crosses, we need to make sure that we understand we have specific names for each generation within our cross. And the very first generation that we work with is always considered the parental generation. So if you look over here on the right, we have a cross occurring between a purple flower and a white flower. That is going to be our very first cross. So that's considered a parental cross. So again, that's the parental generation. Now, any of the offspring that are produced from that cross, this is going to be considered the F1 or first filial generation. So this is going to be the offspring of the P generation. Now, Mendel discovered that all of the F1 offspring from his initial cross had the characteristics of only one of the parents. Now, remember, he was looking at plants or characteristics within those plants that were very um, contradictory in a way. In other words, for example, we had a purple flower versus a white flower. We had a yellow seed versus a green seed. So they were very contrasting. In other words, very different from each other. But what he had noticed is that when he crossed those contrasting characteristics, that typically only one of the characteristics of the parents would show up. So if you look over here on the right, the purple crossed with the white, you only get the purple flower produced in the entire set of offspring that's produced in that F1 generation. So he formed two conclusions from this. He concluded that an individual's characteristics or traits are determined by factors in factors or pieces that are passed from one parental generation to the next. And what he did is he called these factors genes. Now some alleles or different forms of a gene are dominant and some of them are considered recessive. Now this is referred to as the principle of dominance. So for example here, if you look at this purple flower, this might be considered the dominant allele and this would be considered the recessive allele. Now I'm using the word allele. The difference between a gene and an allele really is very, very um, subtle. There are genes, there are those little pieces that actually are used to carry this characteristic. So there is a gene for flower color in garden peas. And this gene is going to be either in the form of a purple or a white gene. Now when you think about the two different varieties of that gene, that's when we use the term alleles. All right? Now when we start working with these actual terms, when we start working with Punnett squares and stuff, they're going to make a lot more sense. But this whole idea of one being more dominant over the other, in other words, one's dominant, one's recessive, is considered the principle of dominance when you talk about characteristics within an organism. So organisms that have at least one dominant gene will exhibit that trait. Now, I guess actually right here I should put the word allele and not gene. So again, remember, alleles are different forms of that gene. So organisms with at least one dominant allele will exhibit that trait. So if you notice here, say for example, um, if you look at the F1 generation here, and let's say we went ahead and said, okay, we're going to use the letter A. A is going to be, and it's going to be a capital A, is going to represent the purple allele, and a lowercase a is going to represent that white allele. If you look at the um, offspring produced from that parental cross, you're going to notice it's purple. One was contributed from one parent, 
and one was contributed from the other. When I say one, I'm talking about um, a gene. And if you look, there's at least one dominant allele present in this offspring. And if you have at least one, you're going to get that dominant trait. Now, an organism with a recessive allele will only show that trait if there's no dominant allele present. So if you look down here, and we haven't quite got to the idea of what an F2 is yet, but if you notice right down here we have a white flower. The only way you're going to get a white flower is if you actually have two recessive alleles. And they only, always come in pairs because you get one from the male and you get one from the female. Or you get one from the mom and you get one from the dad. Now if you notice down here on the right, there is no dominant allele present. There's no capital letter. So there is no way that that dominant trait can actually be expressed. But if there was, if there was a dominant or capital letter there, it would have to be a purple color. That dominant trait would be expressed. Now based on what Mendel had observed when he had looked at the P generation and then the offspring produced from that cross, which of course would be the F1 generation, he had a question. He was wondering, had that recessive allele actually disappeared? In other words, had that recessive variety for that plant actually disappeared or was it actually still present and maybe just hidden? And so what he did is he actually allowed his F1 plants, so we're talking about the plants that you see right here, he allowed them to self-pollinate. All right, And when they self-pollinated, they produced offspring. Now what he had found is that when he looked at the F2 generation, which would be the offspring from the self-pollination that occurred here, he had found that actually that recessive allele appeared again. Now I want you guys to look at the example again on the right here. We're looking at a different characteristic but it's the same exact principle. We're looking at this case where we have the height of the plant. In other words these T's represent whether or not we have a tall plant versus a dwarf or a short plant. And if you have a capital T, if you have that gene, if you have that allele, then you will be tall. If it's absent, as we had said before, then it's going to be short. Now remember, when you have these two T's, one came from the mom, one came from the dad, but when you contribute that T to produce offspring, whether it's sperm or egg, you will only contribute one copy. Now of course, if you have your P generation, both of these organisms up here, both of these plants are considered true breeding, which means if they self-pollinated, they would produce the same identical offspring as themselves. If you look at the contribution they make, the big T is produced by this plant, the little T is produced by this plant. That's all they can produce because there's no big T here and there's no little T here. And when the F generation offspring are produced, you get one of each. But remember, we have a big T present. So if you have at least one dominant allele present, you're going to get that dominant trait. So in this case, we have a tall plant. Now, in case of taking this particular set of offspring and having them again self-pollinate, you're going to notice that we end up with three tall plants and we end up with one short plant because that recessive trait has reappeared again because we end up with a situation where we get a combination where you actually have no dominant allele present. And if that's the case, then the trait will be recessive. So what he had found out was he had actually discovered that that recessive allele, again, appeared again within that F2 generation. Now, so the dominant allele was basically masking the recessive allele. So even though we saw the dominant trait, whether it be the purple flower or the tall plant in this case, that recessive allele, which you can see right here, it's still there, but it's kind of being covered up. So it reappeared because the recessive allele had separated or segregated from the dominant allele. So what does that mean? If you look at the big T and the little t, remember that we're going to produce eggs and sperm from these plants, that means that in this particular plant we have reproductive cells being produced and in this case if we're looking at the male reproductive cells, that male reproductive cell could either be a big T or it could be a little t. So again, these two together separated from each other and the same thing goes for the eggs. It had the same genetic makeup. It had a big T and a little t, but they separated from each other.
And so when they separate from each other, you can get different combinations in that F2 generation. We consider the sperm and the eggs, again, the gametes that are produced by that plant or animal. All right, so that's going to finish up our very first screencast for Chapter 11. Now, I do understand there were a lot of terms that I threw at you with this video, but again, please do not stress. We are going to get plenty of practice with this information in class. Now, of course, please make sure that you have completed your screencast notes and are prepared when you come to class.